time to cancel the cabal with Stephen Roberts. On MSI Radio. All right, uh, all right, and welcome everyone. Sorry about that Skype going off, but uh, I believe that's Janice right there. So welcome, Janice. You can listen in. Um, Thank this you. is Unraveling the Secrets. I am Stephen Roberts, and this is uh, I have Suzanne Pulls out with me, and we have a very special guest with us. Um, we have former. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're originally from the Carolinas. Georgia. Georgia. Okay, I'm sorry. Yes, uh, former Georgia Congresswoman Cynthia McKinney. Welcome to the show, Cynthia. Well, thank you so much for finding me yes. and inviting me to come to come on board. Thank you. Welcome also, Suzanne. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. I'm ecstatic to be here because she's uh, I'm one of her biggest fans also, as you happened to mention to her just a few minutes ago. Uh, a lot of people here in America are big fans of you since you... Um, Lost your, lost your last run in uh, Georgia for uh, Congress. Uh, you've you've been on the trail of um, fighting corruption. Just I've on, been on the trail of the bad guys. <laughs> trail of the bad guys. Yes. Um, you. <laughs> excuse me. I am I am fighting something that my doctors are trying to find out. I've uh, got a cough here for. About the last four months that they can't find, but um, Cynthia, uh, tell everybody where you are and tell tell everybody what you're what, what you're doing. Uh, you're not in the states right now. I'm not in the states. I'm in Asia. I'm in Dhaka, Bangladesh, and um, <clears throat> I'll be here for a few more months and possibly longer. Um, I'm working on my PhD. My PhD institution is Antioch University and the PhD will be in leadership and change, something that we desperately need in the United States. And my belief is once we get the right kind of leadership in the United States in positions of authority, then we can have the right kind of change that we all so desperately want and that our country so desperately needs. But once we take care of our business in the United States, then it will be easier for other countries to take care of their business because one of the prime objectives of leadership and the change that we need today is that the United States needs to take care of the business of the United States, of the people of the United States. There's a reason that the U.S. and U.S. corporations are going abroad and, and um, sending jobs abroad. And that's because other countries invested in the education of their people. I'm talking primarily about India now that invested in the education of its people. 
and it had the kind of government, this is back during the day, um, where Indians were educated. And today, the country of India creates um, or graduates more scientists than any place else. So um, now that doesn't mean that we don't have the capability. It's just that we have allowed corporations instead of focusing on the um, uh, the the educational needs right in the United States. We've allowed them to actually get a reward and subsidize them going out and taking the the brain power from other countries. It's wrong on both counts. And we have people who languish in poverty, languish in unemployment right in our own country. And it's wrong. We have a whole set of um, regulations and laws that are misguided. Dr. King said guided missiles and misguided men. Well, we've got a lot of them and a few misguided women now who uh, are, are seeking and are in leadership positions in the United States, and the people have to wake up and change them. Yes, they do. Go ahead and start us off, Suzanne, if you'd like. Absolutely. Cynthia, I've been writing a lot of articles about Common Core, and it's the main reason why I homeschool my children. How do you think that Common Core is deserving uh, different sects of our country, sort of um, maybe pushing them into <coughs> certain job descriptions later on in life where they would kind of have no choice educationally but to choose a lower paying job or, or a, a job where there's no real hope of advancement? Well, you know, I'll have to be honest with you. Um, my my only child is well. He just had his twenty ninth birthday, and um, so thank goodness I uh, got him through through college, and and now I'm putting myself back through. He finished with his JD, um, but I have not studied the Common Core. So if you sort of tell me what Common Core is, then I'll be able to comment a little bit more particularly, but I can tell you that I support homeschooling. Well, Common Core uh, has been a, a set of rules and regulations set up by governors and educators uh, that they're saying is a standard and that it could be voluntary. However, the U.S. government has been monetarily pushing school board districts to accept Common Core um, or they don't get any fiscal funding. So what Common Core has been doing is um, molding our children to accept more technology in lieu of critical thinking skills and education. Let the computer do it. All you need to do is learn how to extract the information from the computer. So tablets and, uh, and laptops and, and computers are available for students. In Marysville, Washington, there is, uh, the school board has decided that they're going to use iPads and that three days out of the week they will have classes online. However, some of the students can't <coughs> Board, a internet connection at home and so this does a disservice these students are, are being literally separated um, from the curriculum that isn't about critical thinking or education and more about skill learning and aptitude uh, but even even at that dumbing down uh, of the education system there is still a, a a further division of students who at home don't have access to internet who cannot fulfill all of their class requirements because they can't use these tablets properly. And I, I see this as a, a way of 
making sure that, that the people in our society who can't afford what is now considered luxury is to, and, and just basic internet service, which you would think, why would that be a luxury nowadays? It's a necessity for life. And yet, kind of pushing them into this box where they have no way to get out of and no way to use education to get themselves out of it because they are cut off from all of the uh, learning that they have access to. Well, um, basically it sounds like what you're describing is the, um, uh, the, internet, the, the internet access gap. And I don't understand why something that was created by government isn't, it, you know, isn't, it has been farmed out to uh, Comcast and AT&T and all these other co corporations and they make huge amounts of money and provide very little service. Demonstrations have been uh, made where municipalities con who con that control the uh, utilities and you're right that internet is, should be treated like a utility because it's, it's necessary now. Um, and uh, they bring the price down. That doesn't mean that AT&T um, and Comcast go out of business, but it means that uh, they get more competition, which is what uh, capitalism is supposed to be about, or at least the U.S. brand of it anyway. And um, so uh, this way, uh, that's one way that you would eliminate or certainly uh, seriously degrade the access to the Internet gap. But um, Common Core has to be about more than just <coughs> access to the Internet. Um, you know, it's sort of like um, uh, No Child Left Behind. And I have to admit that I relied on, this is one of the times that I relied on the Democratic Party and I'll not do that again. I'm not going to rely. I'm going to rely in the future on my common sense. But the Democratic leadership deferred to uh, well, they all got in a room and decided what was going to happen, and they told the rest of us to come along, and that was to support uh, No Child Left Behind, which I did, and then only afterwards found out all of the shortcomings. And the states then worked feverishly to get my home state, state of Georgia, exe you know, exempted from the provisions and, and then, you know, down to uh, certain um, uh, school districts. But um, the, the United States is not performing in education. Now, if the United States government can provide missiles that kill people accurately, you would think that they ought to be able to devise a way um, respecting the various levels of authority um, to educate our children and provide them the means by which they can perform critical analysis of anything that's presented to them. It is unfortunate because the the common core that we see today is um, the next generation of No Child Left Behind. And like I said before, it it's the reason why I homeschool my child. I realized that my son was not going to get any critical thinking skills at all. Um, my son is eight years old and for the last year he's been learning on a third to fourth grade level because at his age he's a sponge and there is no this is too complicated for him to understand uh, properly explained he understands um, complex cosmological theories uh, he understands uh, his favorite is science and engineering and my son is learning to use AutoCAD right now um, and he's doing very well building uh, virtual buildings and virtual structures and he's he just turned eight years old so my son's potential is wasted in school. Uh, giving you an example, I don't know if you heard recently in the news, in Colorado, students protested a change to U.S. AP history that 
in in the um, in the name of getting rid of dissenters and and civil disobedience, the curriculum omitted people like Benjamin Franklin, uh, um, uh, two more of our founding fathers, uh, people who signed the uh, the Constitution, um, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X any of the leaders in our history who have led movements that have uh, thankfully led to some incredible change in our um, in our American story but they don't want to facilitate any more uh, possibility of civil disobedience or civil dissent and just like really good teenagers when you tell them not to do something they go ahead and they do it so they organized within uh, 20 different schools in five different districts to protest and come out of the classrooms anywhere between 8.30 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. And it was amazing to see, and these children did this protest for several days, every single day. It was only on the third day that the mainstream media picked this story up and started discussing it. I guess because they realized the students weren't going to give up. They didn't want their curriculum changed just because we don't want to have dissenters in our society any longer. Well, um, you know, what ought to be added to the curriculum is what the United States government did to people who dissented. And we have a record of that. We have evidence of that um, with the counterintelligence program and the uh, reports that were generated by the uh, um, Senate in, uh, Select Committee on Intelligence, um, the work that was done by, by Senator Frank Church. So um, dissent is, is more precious, should be treated more preciously um, by our society than, um, than asset because it is those people who say, well, hey, 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 wait, 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 are we sure this is the road that we want to take? They are, one, acting out of a sense of, of patriotism and um, their point of view should be taken into account so that when a decision is made that it can be <clears throat> strongly supported by the entirety of the society because every point of view has been discussed and um, uh, considered in the lead up to the decision making. I'm looking here at a um, website that is describing what is the common core and it says that it is a set of clear college and career ready standards for kindergarten through 12th grade in English language arts literacy and mathematics um, and that's uh, uh, that's interesting I don't see science in here um, and then it says um, that its purpose is to ensure that students graduating from high school are prepared to take credit bearing introductory courses in two or four year college programs or enter the workforce. Well, um, uh, that's what our, um, our uh, sort of minimum standards of the educational system should be now, but um, there are people who are graduating and they don't know how to read. And the society, not the society, certain individuals prey on those individuals and on that structural imbalance by um, uh, privatizing prisons and projecting that if you can't read by the fourth grade, then you're going to end up in prison. And then the prisons are privatized, so there is an incentive to not teach those kids because um, uh, the, there's going to be a profit in the end. Remember the judge in Pennsylvania who was getting kickbacks by putting kids in who, who, who had problems, legal problems and um, disciplinary problems. Disciplinary problems often lead to legal problems instead of disciplinary solutions. 
Um, uh, and the judge was getting a kickback by sending the kid to, to a certain private um, uh, juvenile institutions. So when you have a corrupted system, everything gets touched and corrupted. It's like the rotten apple in the barrel making all of the other apples that are in the barrel rotten too. So um, we have so much that, has, that we have allowed to um, go wrong and get corrupted in our system that we really need the kind of leadership that will get in there and um, it needs to be authorized by the people, supported by the people, legitimized by the people, and, so, and, and really, really supported so that they have the authority to go in there and root out all of the corruption. Uh, Congresswoman McKinney, what, what do you think... Um what do you think a solution to this, the Common Core, or the uh, and and also the the previous uh, No Child Left Behind? What do you think a solution is to uh, these problems? Well, um, I think uh, first and foremost that the the teachers really are the ones who are in the best. You have teachers, and you have. Um, psychologists who uh, study behavior and they study learning. So uh, you have the, the scientific community and you have the practitioners. Between the scientific community and the practitioners there ought to be a coming together and at that coming together there ought to be um, a set of recommendations made on the future of education in the United States. Then you bring in the additional stakeholders and unfortunately um, the parents are left out. Corporations are opted in all of the time because I've seen that happen time and time again in my home state where the Chamber of Commerce has more say than the parents. And um, so you, you would have parents involved, you would have the chamber involved, and um, because these are future employers, and um, so you, you would have all of the stakeholders involved, and this is something that is possible to be done. It is not um, something that can't happen, but it won't happen without the right kind of leadership. I would like to uh, change the topic just a little bit and go to um, Liberia. Um, just recently, six military planes carried 4,000 combat-ready troops to Liberia, and their job is to work with military engineers and planners to set up uh, makeshift uh, mission areas where they can build buildings and uh, teach people how to deal with Ebola. Uh, they have an Ebola training academy that the UK has sent 750 soldiers to construct as well as treatment centers. What do you see happening over there in Liberia uh, with Ebola? What, are, what do you think is the most important thing that we should be focusing on when it comes to this issue? Well, I, I, those uh, troops that went over there, are, are they from the 101st Airborne? I mean, you know, I don't think they have a, a track record in um, medical supply and um, uh, uh, pra medical practitioning. So uh, I think that was the absolute wrong decision on our president to send U.S. troops over there um, to do... Uh, work. I, I think the, the U.S. troops are over there um, perhaps to do something else, but um, a, health, a health issue does not require a militarized response. When I get sick, I don't want to see a soldier with a gun. Remember, this is the same response that the failed response that the United States 
provided after Hurricane Katrina. Instead of helping the people, the Bush administration sent soldiers in with guns. And that only exacerbated the problem. Of course, you, in addition to that, having um, mercenaries um, uh, roaming on the streets and uh, shooing people off the streets in, in New Orleans. Uh, Blackwater was was sent, invited to go there by um, the um, Michael Chertoff. So um, we had the same, a similar thing happen after um, the earthquake in Haiti where predator drones were sent in um, rather than, and, and the billions of dollars that people donated have not been expended on behalf of the Haitian people. So um, here we have a similar situation of an emergency and a militarized response. That's all it seems that the United States is prepared to do. And um, uh, that, that, the entire response to um, the Ebola crisis causes one to ask more questions than are answered. I agree. I noticed in the news that the head of uh, ExxonMobil, Rex Tillerson, was speaking in Houston about 20 minutes from Dallas where the gentleman who was uh, diagnosed with Ebola came in through the airport. Uh, however, at this uh, meeting, Rex Tillerson was speaking about the delay for their exploratory uh, measures to get natural gas and petrol off of uh, the coast of Liberia. Um, their concerns were related to the delays to, to this uh, mission uh, related to the Ebola outbreak. However, ExxonMobil described the Ebola outbreak as a fairly low-level threat, even though they are in Liberia, which is the hardest-hit area. That concerns me. What do you think is going on, especially since uh, we were just talking about the 4,000 troops that just landed over there? Well, you know, the response doesn't make any sense. And so you have to, because the response doesn't make any sense, you use your uh, power of critical thinking and you say, okay, this doesn't make sense. Um, the Cubans send doctors and the United States send soldiers. Um, uh, what else is going on? And of course, we understand the, the natural resources that are in that area and the offshore resources that are in that area and um, the scramble for those resources that has been going on for really nonstop since uh, the Berlin Conference. <coughs> so um, um, you just have to wonder uh, the, the response, the U.S. response doesn't make sense if you're looking at uh, medical responses and medical needs. Therefore, you have to explore other, other options for explanation. And that's what I would do. You know, um, uh, my mother was a emergency, she's retired now, but she was a, an emergency nurse. And her first reaction was, this is not normal. Her first reaction when they brought the two uh, uh, healthcare professionals from the area and brought them to the United States, and now I think it's up to three that they brought in, um, her response was that it's not, this is not, <laughs> this is not normal. And um, so she's been questioning ever since, just sort of uh, as an informed person um, with emergency critical care background, um, you know, what's going on? I'm a lay person and I, I certainly don't know what's going on and we don't know what the truth is. We won't know the truth unless somebody goes over there or unless we have whistleblowers. There's been one whistleblower and that's a professor 
at uh, Delaware State, I believe, who um, just came out. I believe he's a Liberian, is of Liberian descent. descent. And um, he just came out and, and, and said that uh, more, this was more a Pentagon operation. Well, that it would explain the Pentagon response. Um, and, and, and that the United States government had been over there for, for a very long time testing various drugs on people. Well, we know that that is not an unusual um, uh, circumstance. Heck, they did that here in the United States with the Tuskegee experiment. And they did it in Guatemala. So why wouldn't they go to Africa and do it as well? Absolutely. There's so many questions. And like you were saying, when you look at the response to the problem and it doesn't fit, and you look at what ExxonMobil is doing in that area, and ExxonMobil is saying that uh, there's a hundred years worth of natural gas if the United States were the only country to use it. And I thought it was interesting that Rex Tillerson used the United States in conjunction with speaking about extracting Liberian resources. Right. That's, that, that, that's uh, very important. And, and, and of course, obviously you've done um, far more research on this than I have and therefore um, you, you're aware of these other circumstances. These other circumstances do, in fact, help to explain why the, the U.S. provided a militarized response as contrasted with the Cubans who sent in doctors. Absolutely. Absolutely. And there are further comments that I wanted to uh, get your take on. Uh, Hillary Clinton was speaking at the Economic Club uh, this week talking about ISIS, her uh, quote is, uh, it's a serious threat because this is the best funded, most professional, expansionist, jihadist military force we have ever seen. This is far more advanced and far richer than Al-Qaeda ever was. Knowing well, what we know about her knowledge of how Al-Qaeda was formed, um, there are several videos of her speaking um, to, to senators about how we created Al-Qaeda. What do you think um, she's actually talking about, or what are your comments about her saying that ISIS is now the uh, most advanced, far richer, uh, most professional jihadist group we've ever seen? Well, um, clearly she knows what she's talking about. And there's a reason for that as well. Uh, she knows about it because um, the United States helped cre create it. And um, when you um, create finance, weaponize it, um, this has been the um, modus operandi for the United States for a very long time. And it happened on um, the African continent. Oh my gosh. Um, I mean, you know, they would create a rebel group, arm that rebel group, then provide the mechanism and the military support so that rebel group can threaten the capital city of a president that you know, decided that he was going to represent his <clears throat> country and the people in his country rather than the interests of the United States. And this is how such a president was treated. This happened over and over again. Happened to uh, Laurent Kabila in, in, in uh, Congo. It happened in Sierra Leone to that democratically elected president with the creation of the um, uh, Fode Sanko uh, and the Revolutionary United Front. <coughs> it happened in Cote d'Ivoire and Ivory Coast with um, the uh, creation of a rebel group to threaten the presidency, the democratically elected presidency of um, Laurent Gbagbo. Um, it, um, gosh, this, it, it happened when the United States 
provided tens of millions of dollars every year to Jonas Avimbi. Um, it uh, continues to happen when the United States provides um, monetary support and legitimacy, legitim legitimizing behavior toward the genocidal uh, government in Rwanda and the government in uh, Uganda. <laughs> it, also, it also happened so, in uh, Iraq in, in 1959. The CIA funded um, Saddam Hussein and his uh, and his uh, ragtag group, and they and they overthrew um, Mossadegh there. That's right. You're at, uh, um, uh, Mossadegh was in Iraq in, in Iran, right, and yes. um, Saddam Hussein was in Iraq. But yes, you're absolutely right. This is a um, there's a, 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 a researcher, a scholar, who did research on the pattern of repression of the FBI under COINTELPRO. <coughs> and he found that the FBI found certain repressive acts to, to always work, so they always use them. And that's the way the United States government is. They found that creating these rebel groups, arming them, providing military logistics so that, you know, it's really <clears throat> U.S. Uh, special forces along with some mercenaries that are really doing the hard work and these guys just walk in and proclaim victory. <clears throat> but that this is a tactic that works. And they tried it all over Africa, and it worked. And so they exported that now to other parts of the world. That is what we're seeing, and that is what um, <coughs> ISIS is. It's been it's been coined um, problem, reaction, solution, uh, Cynthia. <coughs> they uh, they they fund and and create a problem in these uh, terrorist groups, and. Um, these terrorist groups attack their their own country's um, parliaments or their uh, governments, and the solution is for the um, U.S. troops to come in and uh, take these terrorists out. <laughs> yeah, after the U.S. has created them. Exactly. Um, yes. Yeah, you know, or uh, what happened on the African continent was that the U.S. troops didn't come in but that either those governments that were problematic either got ousted or they shaped up and um, bent over. I'm going to have to get something to drink. Oh, certainly. Do you want to take a uh, do you want to take a short break here? Oh well, I I guess we can talk for a few seconds here, Suzanne. Absolutely. Go ahead. I think that. When you look at what the International Republican Institute is doing, um, the IRI.org, if you're curious, go to their website. Uh, John McCain is on their board of directors, which is uh, not a coinky dink since he likes to take pictures with uh, the heads of all of these <laughs> terrorist um, groups. Yeah, yeah, these uh, you know the Free Syrian Army and ISIS and all sorts of people. Uh, this is what the United States government has decided is foreign policy to create a fake revolution in a country to topple a government to put in a patsy and like what we saw in Egypt um, sometimes the patsies only work out for a year uh, Mohammed Morsi is, is has been taken out or sometimes the relationship lasts a little bit longer like what we were talking about Saddam Hussein um, in that instance he got to sit in that seat a little bit longer but it seems that this is foreign policy for our government to make sure that they have control over eventually it comes down to resources and allocation for corporations to go in and extract and and sell on global markets are you back with us now, Cynthia? Yes, I am. Okay. <laughs> I had to uh, give me some water also. I've been talking here quite a bit today, and uh, my voice shows it sometimes. Yes. Um, I've wondered, I've asked Suzanne before, and I've asked other guests, 
um, with the with the track record of the the White House, uh, and it goes way way back, uh, back into the uh, 30s and 40s. Um, they've been doing these these types of things. Um, Communist Mao was um, funded and started by by U.S. interests. Um, a lot of people don't know that, but um, mm -hmm. I wonder how many of these countries are. How long is it going to take them to uh, get wise and to uh, stay away from American interests and the American government? Well, that's a good question, and um, <clears throat> you would hope that they would learn. Um, I hope that um, that uh, they do learn. <clears throat> It seems that uh, not only in, in countries, but also the, the advent of nanny state here in the United States. Uh, we can look at Seattle. Just recently, Seattle passed, uh, the city of Seattle, rather, passed an ordinance stating that if they found 10% um, of your garbage was uh, food, you know, leftover food that you throw away that could be used for compost that they would start fining you. And so they are allowing the uh, the garbage collectors to go through your garbage and check to see how much you have and uh, how, how much, uh, so they know how much to charge you when they go ahead and fine you. And you had mentioned to us before the show that you were... Um, that you are going to do, be doing something in the state of Washington. Can you explain that to us? Oh, well, I'll just be defending my dissertation, hopefully. And um, the, the school, Antioch University, has a campus right in Seattle. And hopefully I'll um, uh, defend my dissertation in Seattle. That's what I hope to take place. And... If so, um, that's going to be a fantastic celebration for me. <laughs> yeah. Suzanne, it seems we have to let uh, Cynthia go here. So um, I guess maybe we should um, ask you what you're going to be coming up, what you're going to be doing before the uh, uh, Washington dissertation. And do you have anything? Well, I, got, I, I just got my um, comments back from my professor. Um, this is, uh, what, midnight there, but I just got my uh, comments back um, today. And so I'm going to work feverishly over the next week to try and get everything um, perfected so that I can turn it back in. I'll be doing schoolwork, and um, I just need you guys to wish me some luck, but... Um, come January in Seattle, I want you to look out for me. In the meantime, we can stay in touch with each other um, on Facebook. My Facebook page is Cynthia McKinney Official. Well, that's good. Um, do you have any other websites or anything like that you'd like to plug? No, just uh, let's stay in touch on Facebook. And that's, and that's how I got in touch with her, Suzanne. Um, I would have thought that uh, she would have had an assistant uh, that, that would have been, been running her social media, but, but she does it. She does it herself. I do. Well. Okay. Well, we, do, um, we sure do appreciate you coming on for the time that, you're, uh, the time that you said you were going to come on. That was just 45 okay. minutes. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Have a good thank day. Thank you so day. much, Cynthia. Yes. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.